Hey, it's Right Blend. I'm here to summarize day 44 of the trial of Tamara Leach and Chris Barber. It was a heavy defense day, but a good defense day. We heard from Mr. Lawrence Greenspun as he explained his 10 elements of the defense, of the themes he thinks that he's, I think, proven that are favorable to the defense in the evidence. And as well, there's other important things to talk about. Two key elements. Yes, a lot of lists today. Two key elements, he says, are unprecedented in this case that are leading, that should lead to an acquittal of the accused, to Merrill Leach and Chris Barber. And as well, four key points of defense for the mischief charges. So 10 elements in the evidence that he says are favorable to the accused two key elements of the trial itself that include some of those elements to be honest that he says should lead to a favorable outcome for the the accused and then four specific elements of the mischief defense that lead to specifically uh, should lead to an acquittal on the mischief elements it's been a busy week of trial and it doesn't slow down from here folks so yes it, it was supposed to be the last day of trial on friday it's not the last day of trial the crown is of course exercising their right of reply so they say that they well let me explain it this way the crown was willing to do their reply in writing but the judge insisted at the end of day Friday that because of the public interest in this case, despite the public being able to request the writing, the written crown closing reply argument to the defense closing argument, that it should be done in open court. He sa she said we don't have closed courts in this country, so she would prefer to have those done in court, at least to have an oral segment of the crown's reply. So the crown will take two hours and we know that I put that in quotations because it's never on time. Two hours is a day. And Mr. Greenspan joked too. He's like, are we now saying that the two hours the crown asked for is half a day? <laughs> uh, it's funny. Mr. Greenspan's a funny guy. His humor is fast. His words are fast. His law is heavy. So yes, the crown will have two hours to reply on the 13th of September. And then technically the trial will be over. The trial will be over. And will await the verdict. The, the judge said that she knows she has six months to deliver the verdict, but she does not want to take that long. So it's going to be a lot. She's asked for some time off to be able to consider the evidence. And there's a huge amount of evidence. There's between all the lawyers, there's a over, there's a hundred cases that have been cited to prove things like aiding and abetting, mischief case law, obstruct case law, intimidation case law, case law on Carter, the Carter test in RV Carter, uh, you know, reasonable doubt and circumstantial evidence rv villadova villadova i don't know i'm sorry I, there's so much case law here it's a it's a rather recent case and, it, it, and i believe it goes to uh to circumstantial evidence that if there's two reasonable inferences of a piece of evidence you look at something like tamara leach saying hold the line and one of the reasonable inferences is that she's doing something criminal and one of the reasonable inferences is that she's not doing something criminal or there's more than one reasonable inference that's not guilty like if there's if there's just if there's just a guilty inference and circumstantial evidence convict them if there's a, a guilty inference and one or more inference where reasonable inference where it's not a guilty like not by saying hold the line to Merrill Leach is reasonably inferred to mean stay true to your values then she's not guilty so these are the standards and these are all in case law and it's all been presented and laid out hard and heavy for the judge the judge is a very fast leader fast reader and I say she's very active she's a very active listener and i think she's very aware and alive to a lot of the issues in the trial she's been very fair and i believe that the political element of this is in the prosecution the decision to prosecute this case the decision to pursue it with the vigor and enthusiasm that the crown has in all of these convoy cases low-level mischief cases uh for example rv remley which greenspan brought up as local jurisprudence from the convoy but also the judge in this case was the judge in that case. And in that case, this judge, the judge there, acquitted Mr. Remley. Uh, he was accused of operating a mobile gas tank. And as I understand, it was said by the trial judge, who's the trial judge in this case for, Lich, uh, for Tamara Lich and Chris Barber, that the evidence was not good. They never inspected what was in the case. They never, in the, in the tank, they never saw him pouring it. So she couldn't convict them. Reasonable doubts and all that. And the Crown appealed that, took it to the appeals court, to the because this is in the Ontario Court of uh, Ontario Court of Justice, took it upstairs to the Ontario Superior Court of Justice, which is a federal like it's a federally paid, federally appointed, whereas this is provincially paid, provincially appointed, and uh, the judge in that 
court ordered a new trial and said that the trial judge, the judge in our trial for Tamara and Chris, erred. So by Greenspan bringing that up is both a reference to the jurist precedence, but also, you know, when he's referencing it, I, th I feel like there might be some lawyer games going on there. Not in a malicious way, but saying, you know, the judge in that case knew what she was talking about kind of thing, right? Uh, that's not an exact quote, but that's the kind of vibe I was getting on some part. I might be wrong. Oh, look, it's the musical ride passing me. Oh, look, two trucks for the musical ride carousel, RCMP. Those were the people who were fawning in the Chateau Laurier with fancy taxpayer dinners in the finest dining in downtown Ottawa, praising the trampling of Candace Sato and uh, the unknown man who is alive during the trampling in the, uh, of the protesters. And they were the ones in the group chat who were saying how awesome it was, praising the Toronto Police Cavalry Unit for an excellent maneuver. So I do not like the musical ride anymore. Uh, sad. <laughs> So let's dive into the 10 elements. The first element is direct traffic. Mr. Greenspun pointed to the evidence from cross-examination, from evidence, from examination in chief, from other things, from videos, that the police directed protesters where to park. Said, if you're coming from Western Canada, follow this road and park here. And there was these maps made by the Ottawa police and they were handed out. We heard it from the testimony of Lucas and others. They were aware of these maps. They were created by the police and given to protesters. There was also um, traffic control devices. You know, those orange traffic thingies that you could see on the side of the road. Temporary signage. And a T I'd forget the TC number for any of my book seven guys in Ontario. You might know what the TC number of those things is. Is it TC seven? You know, the, the, the mobile sign things where it had like little like convoy follow left turn up this way and and also maps literally given to people so the police told people where to park and let them stay there now this also goes to the one of two key elements oh here look another musical ride uh truck and and then here is a coach and that's probably full of them so and he gives more musical ride to trigger me while i'm making my video i'm so triggered no i'm okay i'm okay i don't hate them that much i just i, I think they're disgusting for the that the that conduct in their group chat and the fact is i don't think they've ever been reprimanded for that it was that's not prof police like police professional policing conduct if that was any other group of people and they're celebrating a trampling or uh you know a, a, a calvary routing they would be disciplined for that you know and especially uh, what was it? One of them said, let us, you know, we'll make them hear our jackboots on the ground. It's just disgusting. It's just the attitude, the, the ego, all that stuff. It's not cool. It's not Canadian. It's, uh, you know, they could do their own thing. No, I don't care. So the directing of traffic, Greenspan argues in his one, in both the 10 elements and also the one of the two key elements of the trial there's no example in case law anywhere, or we we would have seen it by now. And the judge even said that herself. She's like, I'm sure if we there was no, that was more for the Carter and the being uh, the the unlawful design being something that's lawful on his face. Ending mandates is lawful. Drug trafficking is not lawful. And we've talked about Carter a lot. Basically, where there's there's no example in the law in history of a common unlawful design under the Carter application framework where the common unlawful design is on its face, not something that's illegal. So in this case, the common unlawful design is to have governments end the mandates. It's not drug trafficking. It's not something heinous. It's it's legal. on its first, It's a democratic goal and mean and purpose. And then the Crown saying, oh, it's illegal because of the means. But we don't have an example of a Carter application where the purpose of the of the thing is something that's illegal. So that's unprecedented. But so the direction of police, there's no example in the case law of a protest being told where to park, staying there because they weren't given a time limit. And as Miss Megas said, as I've been saying from the rooftop, screaming it, there's no le time limit on a legal protest. They were never told to leave. So there's no example in case law of protesters being told to go somewhere and then being prosecuted for going there. So that's key element number one. And while we're there, we might as well jump to key element number two of Mr. Greenspan's two key elements that he says basically destroys this case. And I think I agree. And the second element being there's no example in any case law of a protest receiving judicial acknowledgement and basically a sanction of what they were doing. In the Justice McLean uh, Superior Court of Ontario, uh, Superior Court of Justice uh, interlocutory order of uh, February 7th, Lee v. Barber et al., there is a acknowledgement, and I believe para seven of the aura, par, uh, paragraph seven of the order, where it says the defendants remain at liberty to engage in a peaceful, lawful, safe protest as long as the terms of this order are complied with. And the th only thing that the 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 order dealt with was the horns. And as 
Mr. Greenspan pointed out, Justice McLean would have been well alive and aware of the issues on the ground at the time and uh, any such issues of the traffic issues of whatever else was happening. And all he did was say, don't honk. He didn't say go home. He didn't say disperse. He said the defendants remain at liberty to engage in a lawful, safe, peaceful protest. So there's judicial acknowledgement. That's the defense's argument. And the defense's job is not to prove anything. It's not to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. Their job is to cast doubt. It's the Crown's job to prove beyond a reasonable doubt their accusations. The defense has done an amazing job of, of, of casting doubt on the Crown's weak case here. So, I mean, what's the outcome going to be? So directing traffic. They were directed where to go, and they went there. The second was, the second element is also key element number two. So element elements of the defense one and two are also key element one of two. The, they were directed where to go, and they stayed where they were told to go, because not only on the maps did they say where which routes to take based on where you go, but they also said where to park based on where you're coming from. If you're Western Canada, go on, for example, the Sir John A. Macdonald Parkway. If you're from Auto Route 5, go on the Sir George ATN Parkway. If you're uh, whatever, if you have a box trailer with a vet, you know, box trailer, go on Wellington Street. And then it's acknowledged by the judge and, the Green, and Mr. Greenspan in the back and forth on the, on the map, and their color-coded map that the red area that indicates staging areas extends both from Wellington Street down Kent Street and ends at the 417 off-ramp. So actually, Mr. Greenspan made the argument, could it be said that the, it could be said that the protesters were following the police's instructions when they spilled over onto Kent? And he, he, he argued, uh, as it's been very clear, that what happened was both overwhelming to the protest organizers and to the police. The police poorly planned for the event. And we'll get more into that later because there was an interesting exchange that we're going we're to talk about. So the Order of Justice McLean is element two of ten of themes the defense say are favorable to the accused and also key element number two of the two key elements that are unprecedented in Canadian history and that basically destroy this case. Now we move to theme three of things in the evidence that defense say are favorable to the accused and that's a theme that Mr. Greenspan called how long or the time of the protest. They were never told to leave. they you know, the judge, this, this basically carried over from the traffic directions where the judge made a comment that, oh, it's not an issue of where of them parking for a weekend it's an issue of them uh, they were expected to leave to which mr greenspan responded on friday poppycock he said the word poppycock to the judge and he said that's not true he said that's what they want the public to believe but that's not the truth they knew better and i'll tell you how and the judge said i'm listening and so it was a respectful exchange, but Mr. Greenspan was firm in it. And honestly, it was one of the most candid and real moments as, as a fellow observer of the trial. Miss Brenda, I know if you're watching, pointed out it was the realest moment that we've seen in the trial so far when Mr. Greenspan said poppycock. Because, and he said it in a way with emotion, because and not like to the point where he was hysterical, but to the point where he was annoyed because here we are and they knew better the ottawa police had intelligence officer bach knew inspect incident commander ops inspector russell lucas knew they the uh, no natalie hano from oc transpo knew being on those intersect meetings or whatever they're whatever inter, you know the thing that the ncr what is it called again sorry miss hano i forgot oh my goodness there's so many acronyms at oc transpo uh what is that thing meeting called uh, when they they were all meeting at the national capital uh, region command center the ncrcc they were all meeting there and all the different whatever it was all the agencies was oc transpo opp uh, rcmp ops uh roads traffic everybody with the sta all stakeholders stakeholders were meeting there they had intelligence from the hotel association from other people that this was going to be a fluid significant and a long duration uh protest and when mr greenspan was going through these themes of his of, of that the the defense say you're favorable he was going through cross-examination he was going through quotations reading off from the different things that were asked by the crown by him by other people to the witnesses and one of the questions were you know you thought this could go on for a long period of time yes and then the follow-up was oh more than 30 days yes so they knew they knew and like mr greenspan said Oh my goodness, what did, he had a good thing. He said, this is a case of the police, you know, the police said, oh, we let them in. And then, oops, uh, we, we let them stay too long. Oh, you sure did. You sure did, as Mr. Greenspan said it. <laughs> then theme number four, road closures. By who? who? Basically, the evidence shows it. From Hano, from other people. Uh, from I think it was Lucas too that there was that the Ottawa police made the decision to close the roads and that the barricades 
first, uh, you know, including police vehicles, public work vehicles like road graders and snow plows, and then eventually concrete barriers like Jersey barriers were in place before the arrival of the protesters and afterwards to both contain their area and, and to, to set off the staging areas that they were instructed by police in the maps to park in. The road closures were by police. Five, that there were multiple convoys that, and this is important because Tamara Leach and Chris Barber had Freedom Convoy 2022, an incorporated uh, agency, uh, um, organization, where they hired lawyers, accountants, whatever. They tried to keep things above board. But because of the wide support of this issue, ending mandates, and the grassroots nature of things, it went beyond their capacity that they ever imagined and the police ever imagined. And then we had lots of different groups, Farfadas at Rito Sussex, if we've heard evidence from, other groups all over the place, marching to their own drum, where they weren't under the control and command of Chris Barber and Tamara Leach, and that they can't be held responsible for those people. And as well, there was a failure to identify who's with who. We don't even know who these people are, let alone who they were with. Which convoy group are they with? Everybody, you know, Freedom Convoy 2022 is a specific legal entity formed by Tamara Leach, Chris Barber, other people in incorporation in an attempt to keep the protest legal and above board and to handle the massive amount of money coming in. But then there's all kinds of individuals coming in doing their own thing. They can't be responsible for those people. Six, efforts to remain lawful. In all of their communications, Chris Barber, Tamara Leach, they're always saying, be lawful, cooperate with police. We see cooperation with police through the PLTs and their designated assigned people. We've heard lots of evidence of that. And when we've heard evidence about from Chris Barber uh, in, in his videos, whenever he would talk about getting arrested, he would say, put your hands behind your back, take it like a man. He never said, go stand up to them, block them, sit down, oppose them, whatever. At one point uh, after February 8th, and Miss Magus spoke to this, uh, the after the February 7th injunction, he said, if you see a large group of police coming, lock yourself in your truck and honk your horn as a warning. And Miss Magus is arguing, uh, and that's that specifically, I believe that's the charge that Chris Barber has that Tamara doesn't. The obstru um, council uh, disobey court order. And in that case, Magus is arguing that another part of the Justice McLean decision, that it shall not apply to people in execution of a statutory duty, uh, that it falls under that in, in when Barber was saying to people to honk, and also that his mens rea is important, his state of mind at the time, that there was a, there was a lot of fear of kettling, there's, and then she brought it, there was references to the G20 in the case law, there was G20 case law brought up for all of this uh, at different points, there was a lot of case law, folks. I'm going to try to go over what I caught, but even on Friday, you know, maybe I caught 16 pieces of case law, I think, but there was definitely more than that mentioned. So, I mean, uh, it's fast and furious, hard and heavy here. <laughs> I do my best and I know you love it. So thank you so much. Efforts to remain lawful. There was tons of efforts. They hired the accountants. They hired the lawyers. They consulted people like the last living signatory to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Brian Peckford, former pre Premier of Newfoundland. Would people who are trying to have an unlawful insurrection event or whatever, would they try and consult the former, you know, the last living signatory of our freaking Constitution Act 1982, Charter of Rights and Freedoms? Would they consult Brad Wall, former Premier of Saskatchewan? I believe that's who he is. And other such. Would they do that? No. So it doesn't make sense. The emergency lanes was theme seven. There was an effort by convoy and convoy organizers to maintain those emergency lanes. At times they were lost. There was an example, you know, of Chris Barber trying to open up the infamous Kent Street where he, he talked about open, I think it was a text message where, or something like that. He opened up a few blocks of Kent Street after, and again, he's not the king of the convoy. He goes and people disagree with him. And I think this example is good because it both showed that he tried to reduce the, 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 the footprint. And this is before the February 12th Good Faith Agreement. This was, you know, Chris Barber himself on February 8th, I believe it was, after advice from police, his contact officer, Bach, decided to take his truck, Big Red, out of Ottawa to exit 88. So he was leading by example. And he was telling people, there's a video he made, I remember we watched it the other day, where he said, if you have nowhere to, if you don't know where to go, come here to exit 88, there's more space than you could ever do, do anything with. So he was trying to, he was trying, he was trying, his mens rea is not of a guilty criminal, it's just not, you can't, because you need the actus reus, and then you need the, the mens rea, you need the, the act, and the guilty intent, the willfulness to do the crime, and there was just not there. The act isn't there, and the guilt, and, and even if the judge established the act, as the defense says, the mens rea is not there. The guilty mind's not there. So the emergency lanes, yes. Barber tri cleared a couple blocks on Kent Street, and what happened a couple hours later? People filled it right back up again, because he's not the king of the convoy. He went and tried to convince people, hey, it might be a good idea if we free up a couple blocks of Kent Street. They did it, but an hour or two or three later, boom, everybody, you know, different people were back in there. 
And there's nothing he could do. And he was really frustrated about it. But that shows both that he tried and that he was powerless to change the outcome. My goodness. And then this brings us to, uh, this is a good segue to theme eight, which is reducing the footprint. There is a lot of evidence that they tried very hard to reduce the footprint. Chris Barber leaving, uh, setting an example, leaving February 8th. Chris, uh, Tamara Leach herself, there's no evidence she ever had a vehicle in Ottawa. She never honked the horn. She never mentioned the word horn. There's no evidence of any of that. That's why they're so desperate with the Carter application to link Barber and Tamara. Not to say that there's anything with Barber anyways, but there's really nothing with Tamara. So <laughs> they need that damn Carter application so bad. And uh, yeah, yeah. So reducing that footprint, that was important. And Tamara and Chris, they, they did everything they could to do it. They 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 tried to, you know, Chris tried to free up uh, Kent. Couldn't do it. They reblocked it. He tried to move out. He made videos inviting people to exit 88. People did what they did. They tried to do it. And that brings us again as another segue to the theme defense theme number nine, which is the February 12th agreement, the good faith agreement, where Tamara Leach and the mayor of Ottawa, the only politician affected in, in, in any of this at the political at the municipal, uh, provincial, or federal level, actually met with the protesters, and Tamara Leach and the and the mayor m managed to broker this good faith agreement, and then Chris Barber acting on his own agency, not as in the principle to Tamara Leach or in some Carter Carter context, but as a good person, went and convinced on the 13th of February over 100 vehicles, 102 vehicles, I believe it was 40 big rigs, 102 in total vehicles, I believe, to move from residential areas to the Parliament. Now, and then February 14 comes around, Kim Ayotte, the former Ottawa manager of City uh, of Emergency Preparedness Services, sorry, Emergency Protective Services, which is everything except police, fire, paramedic, bylaw, corporate security, expected the work to continue on February 14th, but out of nowhere, the police said, nope, not doing it anymore. So Chris Barber was ready and continued to do this. Oh, Trudeau must not have been aware about that when he invoked the Emergencies Act, or he didn't give a fuck. He just wanted to do it. Now, we know that the Emergencies Act has been declared ultra virus by the, the federal court, by Justice Mosley decision in the uh, Canadian Frontline uh, Nurses case, I believe it was, who brought that to the federal court. And, uh, and he said that it was, you know, violated 2B and was not saved by Section 1. It was not within reasonable limits. To, to violate people that way. It was not a reasonable invocation of the Emergency Acts, nor were the nor were the regulations reasonable under the Emergencies Act, according to federal court. Now, that is going through federal court of appeal, but I don't think it's going to win, because really it shouldn't. It wasn't justified. So now, uh, we, move, we move on. We move on. So February 12th, good faith agreement goes well. Police end it. Police end it. And, and, and Litch had been trying to meet with people. They, everybody had been trying to meet with people. Nobody would. Nobody would. And they, 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 the protesters fulfilled their end of things. It was the police who ended it, who, who stopped it. The protesters always wanted to be near Parliament, but it was very early on in the protest, we heard in the evidence, that it came from Ottawa police leadership, where they had the not-one-inch policy, where they would, no, they would not allow protesters to relocate out of residential areas towards Parliament for no good reason. Probably just a power thing. The police knew that it was going to be a long-duration protest. They allowed them in anyways. They failed. They failed to plan. They failed to enforce, and that brings us to our final defense theme, no enforcement. The defense argued that if this was such an illegal, terrible, consequential thing, where there's this big illegal event happening, how come it took the police so long to begin any kind of enforcement at all? Um, the defense argued that there was no park, not so much as a parking ticket. Now, I know that the Crown's right, the reply is going to heavily focus on this because I do recall, I think there was parking tickets and there was, but the defense argued there wasn't, you know, this could be my misunderstanding. It could be whatever, but I still think all, even this theme is going to go favorable to defense when the judge considers all of this and everything the Crown says in reply, because I think it's true. And the timeline is going to be the critical aspect here for analysis, I believe. But basically, the defense's argument is, if this was such an illegal event, how come there wasn't trespass notices? How come there wasn't, you know, noise violation notices? Whatever. All these different bylaws, the police had the power and manpower to enforce. Now, I know the city, they're going to come back, the Crown's going to say there's thousands of unpaid parking tickets and fines owned to the city. But still, if this was such an illegal event, why didn't they just squash it? And basically, the defense's argument is they didn't squash it because they viewed it to be a lawful protest at the time. And it was only after the fact, in hindsight, that they decided to change course. And those decisions are political. The pro, you know, there's the egg on the prime minister's face, and it must be corrected, just like in everywhere else. And that's what it really comes down to. That's why these low-level mischief cases are being appealed by the best lawyers in the crown attorney's office, the crown counsel's office, and 
where normally they would be there would be deals there would be they would stay the charges because it's just not worth the court's time to be focusing so much resources on this instead of the actual offenders who should be prosecuted who are getting jorted out because this is taking up all the resources in court time the defense did amazing granger greenspun magus Eunice, and i'm sorry i forget the other attorney and then there's another attorney as well another counselor as well there's two other counselors i forget the name of both are are are, are, are nice women with uh, nice ladies with long hair and uh, i'm sorry i forget your names um, one, uh, but uh, they've been instrumental throughout this, these cases, and um, I, I don't think either of them have ever spoken in court. I know we've heard from all the uh, aforementioned other four counselors, but it's been an amazing. Magus did great for Barber, and and in effect for Litch, and Granger and Greenspan did great for Litch, and in effect Barber, and it's it's reckless. So, oh, the four mischief defenses. Well, I'm going to make posts on my Facebook and Twitter today if you want, and I'm going to try to go over the case law I caught and, and give a couple sentences of how I think they are relevant to the case. If you're interested in that, that's going to go up later. And I'm also going to post uh, a summary of the two key elements defense, which is really like two key elements of why the trial should be thrown in the toilet, really. And then the four elements of the mischief defense. The four elements of the mischief defense are lack of willfulness uh, to commit mischief, which, you know, mens rea, whatever. You can't, you can't just have the act, you have to have the guilty mind. So, And then the two statutory defenses, which are points two and three of the four, which are the 430 sub 7 defense, which is uh, the, the, the presiding case law on that would be R.V. Tremblay 2010. And what you know, it was Lawrence Greenspan himself who argued that in the Ontario Court of Appeal successfully, where a neighbor, so 430 sub 7 of the criminal code says that nobody commits mischief who comes to communicate a message. Mr. Greenspan argued, you know what? Every communication communicates a message, unless you're just writing to your diary. And that's there's another case law that says that. And he's like, in, in Trombley, which is a case that he argued in the Appellate Court and successfully, uh, the neighbor basically was a dispute between two neighbors where one neighbor was trying to sell their house and the other neighbor uh, didn't like the other neighbor for I forget what other reason, but he, he had an old vehicle and he parked it on his, the edge of his property line and said, whatever's wrong with your house. He wrote a message on it like, your house is not my fault or something like that. And uh, he was charged and then eventually wasn't convicted of that because he's communicating a message. And the protest, ending the mandates, was communicating a message. So this is the 437 statutory defense for the mischief. And then there's the 429 sub 2, which is a color of right defense under the criminal code uh, for mischief. So nobody, you know, you don't commit mischief if you're legally justified in what you're doing. And they were because they fucking had the judicial notice. The, defend, the, the defendants remain at liberty to engage to in a legal lawful safe protest there's, there's no case law in history where there's a protester who's been charged after ha like with any kind of judicial notice at all never, let, let alone one like that where it says basically it's a sanction and then also being directed to to protest in a place and then being fined and charged for it so i mean there's just so many good things going for defense it's reckless to hypothesize on how this is going to go down I've, taught, I've spoken to Chris and Tamara, not at length about this, but I'm, I'm fortunate to have gotten to know them over this. This has been a very difficult endeavor, but I'm glad I did it. If you appreciate the things that I've done in covering this trial, and it's not done yet, I'm going to cover the verdict. I'm going to take this story to the end. If you appreciate the work I've done, feel free to send me an e-transfer at realrightblend at gmail.com if you feel I've earned it in covering this trial. And I'd really appreciate it if you did. <laughs> it, you know, it, it costs time and money to go to the court every day, and I'm glad to be providing this perspective because as much as the attention has waned, the public interest has waned, the story is still going. On Monday, Jeff Evely, a veteran of the Canadian Armed Forces who was arrested for mischief during the convoy, starts his two-day trial. There's still people all these years later who have still not even started their trial yet Shaba Vizi his trial is starting in September next year we're going to have um, we're going to have Randy Hillier next year I believe and then we're also going to have uh, Harold Junker you know from the Junker trucking he had a lot of trucks at the convoy so all these people still to go and everybody's tuned out but nothing has really changed I'm glad for you guys who are still here all this time later following this important story that will have a lasting impact on our country and I'm hoping for a positive outcome to speculate on the outcome would be reckless and I've talked to Chris and Tamara not very much about this, but their mindset is, as far as I can, I've heard from them, they're prepared for any outcome. I know they're hopeful, and I'm hopeful and praying for a positive outcome. They are prepared for any outcome, but I think no matter how you look at this situation, folks, that they have won. They have truly won this. No matter how it goes down, they have already won. And you can think about how that's the case. You can tell me in the comments how you think they've already won. 
because they've been strong through it, because they accomplished their goals in the protest, because they've been made martyrs. They've been made heroes. And when you have people like Deadder, who is a deranged cartoon... Sorry, you know what? That's not fair. Who is a cartoonist for the Toronto Star, Red Star, and he made a lot of anti-convoy cartoons. I think he made the truck... Was he the one who made the cartoon with the trucks with the word fascism on the side of them coming towards Ottawa? Was that him? He made a lot of those, like, that nature of cartoon, uh, anti-convoy cartoons. He came out a few days ago and he said that this whole trial... He didn't say their names. But he said the trial should have never gone to trial. That it, you know, if they're convicted, they'll be made into two Kyle Rittenhouses, which is foolish because they're they're on a different level than Kyle Rittenhouse. They're above Kyle Rittenhouse, to be simple with you. And, uh, you know, they've done so much more and they're so much more elegant about it, really. And, um, and no, no offense to anyone in particular, but they, they, these people... They're heartful. They're normal. They're they're contributing. They're positive members of society. They have good families. They had good jobs, and they still have them. And uh, they're good people. They're good citizens, and they stood up for something. The regular people who let their voice, who use their voice, and like Greenspan argued, the most p- p- protected time that you're using your expression, your speech, is for political speech, because that's the cornerstone of a democratic society where we have dissent in our political agreement and political disagreement and and damn was that ever a disagreement and it needed to happen and it's democratic to have it so as always thank you for following there's going to be more i'll see you soon from ottawa i'm right glenn